Let's give her a warm PBS welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Most of you know me as Mrs. Danzig, August mom. But for my job as an artist, I use my name, Lava Thomas. And when I was your age, I loved to draw, read, and play the piano. But my favorite thing to do was to draw. I especially like to draw people, my friends and members of my family. Depicting people in art through drawing, painting, and sculpture is called portraiture, and portraiture is one of my specialties. My work relates to real people and real events, current and historic, and today I'm super excited to share my work with you. But before I begin, I'd like us all to take a moment to look around at our PBS community. We are a community of people with diverse characteristics. Some of us have brown skin with dark hair, or fair skin with blonde hair or red hair. Some of us have brown eyes, green eyes, or blue eyes. Some of us come from different countries and can speak different languages. Some of us come from different parts of the United States and some of us were born right here in Menlo Park. We are all part of the PBS community, learning together, playing together, growing together, and working together to reflect our community's core values of courage, kindness, and love of learning. We work to treat one another with respect and to create an environment where we can all be our very best selves. Now imagine for a moment that our gathering, which reflects the diversity of our community, was illegal. That it was against the law to go to school with people whose skin color was different from yours. Or that sitting next to a person of a different race of yours on a bus or on a bench could get you thrown in jail. Now we're imagining this, so it seems unbelievable that this could actually be true, but sadly, there was a time in our country's history when this was a reality. There were places where people of color weren't allowed. People of different races were kept separate with different schools, drinking fountains, and restrooms. This practice of keeping races separate is called segregation. And it was a law in some parts of the United States until only 60 years ago. Those laws were wrong and hurtful. One of my exhibitions revisits this period in our country's history and explores the ways that African American women made it possible for the kind of gathering we enjoy here today in places where it was once illegal. These women were part of the civil rights movement, which included tens of thousands of people, yet most of us only know about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or Rosa Parks. My exhibition, Women of the Montgomery Bus Boycott takes a look back at the women who were left out of this history. Moms, teachers, professors, housekeepers, grandmothers, and attorneys. Ordinary women who were brave enough to risk their jobs and safety to challenge segregation laws. This exhibition of portraits honors their courage and bravery so that their place in history won't be forgotten. Many of us know the story of Rosa Parks. She was a seamstress who rode the bus to get to and from work every day. At the time, the buses in Montgomery, Alabama were segregated, which meant that African Americans had to sit in the back of the bus and give up their seats to a white passenger if there were no empty seats left. Rosa Parks was arrested because she refused to give up her seat like the law required. It was an act that challenged a law that was wrong. Why should she give up her seat? She paid her fare. Didn't she deserve a seat too? This single act of courage set off a chain of events that eventually changed the law. And this portrait is from her arrest on December 1st, 1955. It's based on a mugshot, which is a portrait a photograph taken when a person is arrested. After Rosa Parks' arrest, Joanne Robinson, an English professor, launched a boycott of the bus company. She and a small team of activists 
distributed over 50,000 flyers throughout the black community of Montgomery asking people not to ride the bus for one day. Joanne Robinson hoped that city officials would finally start paying attention to complaints from African American riders. She knew that African Americans made up the majority of the city's bus riders, and without them, the company could go out of business. That one-day boycott was so successful that ministers of black churches in the community held a mass meeting and elected Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to extend and lead the boycott. And attorneys for the NAACP filed a lawsuit against the city to challenge segregation on Montgomery buses. But it was women who started the boycott, women who raised the money, women who organized the carpools and distributed shoes and clothing to the walking boycotters. Women were a very important part of the boycott success. And this is a portrait of Eureta F. Adair. And because of these women, the boycott worked. Over the course of the year-long boycott, the bus company and downtown businesses lost millions of dollars. This made the city officials angry, and they decided that something had to be done. Boycotting was against the law in Alabama, so the officials had all of the boycott leaders arrested, these women included, hoping that they would be frightened and start riding the buses again. And this is a portrait of Mintha L. Johnson. When the boycott leaders learned that they were going to be arrested, they took control of the situation as best they could. Instead of waiting to be arrested in their homes or the places where they worked, they drove to the police station in groups to support one another and turn themselves in. They dressed up in their best clothes as a way to show their self-respect, and they carried themselves with dignity. They even refused to hang the booking numbers around their necks when they were photographed. And you can see the string hanging from Jimmy L. Lowe's fingers here. Mrs. A.W. West was one of the carpool drivers. She was 80 years old when she was arrested. She reminds me of my grandmother. Some of the portraits show how the women felt when they were arrested. This is Lottie Green Barner. She stares directly into the camera. She doesn't look afraid. But Addie J. Hameter appears frightened and looks down. Ida May Caldwell looks sad. I was recently contacted by Ida May Caldwell's son. He told me that both of his parents were civil rights activists who met during the Montgomery bus boycott. For many of the women, their mugshot is the only image of them available, and we only know their names. Alberta J. James. Audrey Bell Langford. Creating the portraits for the exhibition took almost two years. It was labor intensive and time consuming. The technique of creating thousands of strokes for each portrait underscores the fact that working to affect change takes a long time and a lot of work. The boycott ended on December 20th, 1956, a year after it started, when the Supreme Court ruled that segregation on Montgomery buses was unconstitutional. The law was finally struck down. And here are the portraits as they were exhibited at Rena Branston Gallery in San Francisco last fall. And I'd like to thank everyone in the PBS community who came out to see the exhibition. As you grow up and face challenges of your times, I hope that the story of courage and bravery inspires you to act. Know that your individual actions, joined with others, have the power to shape the course of history. Thank you. <laughs>